Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Let's get started. So my name is Taranjit Kaur, and I've been a software architect, a cloud enterprise architect, uh, leading cloud engineering teams. And today I am mortgage technology manager. We are taking care of mortgage technology for m and Bank. So this talk is, a, is, a, is about cloud architectural and sustainability of cloud architecture, right? So I've been in a room full of CEOs, CTOs, and uh, head of architecture, director of architecture engineering, and uh, they all wanted to do, go to cloud, but the, the why and the success was not clearly defined, right? So there have been moments in my career in last five to six years when I realized that this is unlike other projects that I have dealt with because the road to success was not clearly defined. The definition was, I want to go to cloud because my CTO said that, or my CEO wants us to be going on cloud, as opposed to what does being on cloud look like look for my organization. So I thought of this presentation and the sustainability of cloud back in 2022 when the 2023 bank crisis had not happened, right? So now this is so much more relevant when we talk about sustainability and ROI for cloud. So with that, I'll begin my presentation. So most of my presentations are, when I conceive a presentation idea, it's mostly to get my thoughts around with the more broader audience, like-minded people. But this time, there was another reason that I wanted to do this talk. It was to gain experience and knowledge from the audience. So to make this experience more holistic for me, I will request you to give me feedback on the topic, on the presentation, and what you feel about your cloud journey. So this was one of my thoughts that came to my mind, but it could be on internet and somebody said they wrote it, and that's fine too. That's why I wrote anonymous and myself. So it could be anyone, but that was like the whole idea that I wanted to share my thoughts with like-minded people and get your opinion as well. All right. So, like I said, we all have been through cloud journey at this point because cloud is not new at, at now in 2023, right? Some of you have been like more early adopters of cloud and probably 10 years in your cloud journey. Some of, them, of you could be late adopters and could be like three to four years in your cloud journey, right? I think we are at an inflection point when it comes to cloud and that we need to revisit some of the things, some of the decisions we, are ta we have taken in cloud. Maybe it's an opportunity to undo some of the things that we did in cloud, or just, just revisiting the whole cloud paradigm, right? So, like I said, the goal to success was not clearly defined, and I have had people where they said, I want to take this specific application to the cloud, but it does not, I do not want to get off, rid of the things that I had on the on-prem the on, on software, right? So, so they took their organizational barriers onto cloud. And that was one of the challenges which we could, not, we could not overcome when we took our cloud adoption journey. With that, I want to pulse this room with what brings you here, right? Are you part of the cloud journey for your enterprise, making cloud decisions, or you are, you are the cloud architect and you want to be in cloud role? If you can, with your show of your hand, actually I can see people right now, with show of your hand, if, if you can share, are you part of cloud decision making for your enterprise already, or you want to be part of the cloud decision making? If you can just raise your hand and show me if, if you are part of cloud journey already for your enterprise. Okay. All right. So around 50% of you 
I've said that you are part of cloud journey in some form of shape already. Okay, that's good. Is it there anybody in the audience who is like in the recruitment role for the cloud or want to be a cloud architect? Okay. I see some hands. All right. So far less in cloud architecture role and more in decision making. So I'll make it simple. I want to do an analogy of how do we do decision making in our day-to-day -day life. So I'll take an example of something like grocery shopping. Okay. So when you plan to grocery show up, uh, and I'm assuming that it's not an ad hoc grocery shopping that you have to do because you have to kill time. So think of all the scenarios that we consider when we go on a grocery shopping, right? You go to your favorite store, like I'll go to Kroger or in Western New York, we have Wegmans. So I know that's my go-to store and I will get everything from there, right? You could be one of those people. Or you could be somebody who want to just shop on a wholesale market because you, you want to shop for once and then be done for three to six months. Right? So then you'll go to Costco, you'll go to uh, Sam's Club, right? and stuff like that. Or you could be somebody who could be looking at grocery shopping as, I want to shop for the meat shop separately, I want to do some, uh, some dairy separately because they, they serve good dairy products or deli products. So you go to specialized shopping, right? So I pulsed my people in the survey and around 30% said that I have a favorite store that I go to. Roughly around 25% said, uh, said I go to more than one retail outlet. So I'll go to Kroger, uh, I'll go to Walmart, and I'll go to other stores because I get different products from different stores. Right? Or something like I do retail, online, and then specialized shopping. Somebody said I want to go to a meat store because they serve great meat or fresh produces. So we have, we, we do not pledge allegiance to one store or the other. It's just what best suits our needs, right? So I think cloud decision making is kind of similar in, in the process. When we are talking about cloud and what serves our need, it's, uh, it's basically say, saying that I want to go to this cloud provider because it serves my organization need and not pledge allegiance to one cloud provider because that's how it has worked for other organization. So basically finding out the problems that you want to solve for your organization and not going by something which others have adopted and have worked for them, right? So with that, there was a survey which was conducted by Accenture in late 2021, early 2022, which kind of reflected upon the similar outlook for cloud. So you have parameters like, how big is my organization? Am I talking about a five million shop or 10 billion? Am I an early cloud adopter or I have heavily cloud already, right? or I am fully focused on cloud, like cloud first approach, or I'll pick, nitpick all the options that I have in cloud. So those were the parameters that they picked while surveying these executives, chief, uh, chief of staffs, chief executives for uh, cloud survey, which Accenture did in 2021. With that, they concluded that around 75% of the people while only fully achieving their outcome. 25% of actually said they were not satisfied with the outcomes that they're seeing in cloud. And that led me to, be, somebody would believe that because there were barriers like security, you have your legacy applications, you have your complexity, all that transforms differently into cloud, right? So. There were 4% who said they did not achieve the goal of going into cloud. Around 16% said that they were dissatisfied with the cost saving goals. There's a person called David Hanner. He's from 37 Signals, uh, Basecamp. If you know of the product, they, they are the one who invented Ruby on Rails. 
uh, for 37 Signals, which is a product which is used for time management and tracking and uh, management of your personal calendar and th that stuff. He, I follow him on LinkedIn, and he comes up with the notion that cloud is an overkill, and he was the first one who said, I want to move away from cloud. In fact, he writes articles constantly about moving away from AWS. This is nothing against Amazon, by the way. But he said that based on our needs, we are better suited for something like on-prem for our environment as opposed to being on cloud. And he has an interesting observation on why go to cloud and why not go to cloud. So something that he shared just very lately was sovereign clouds, where you don't even call the term cloud because now it has got stigma attached because people are not seeing ROIs. People are not seeing the cost saving that was originally promised. They were able to reduce the CAPEX cost, but the operational cost was not fully understood. In fact, the FinOps becomes so complex that many of the organization have to bail out of cloud because they do not understand the underlying complexity of how the charges were being made to their organization. So he was the first one who came out with the notion. I started following him, and he, he, he talks about sovereign cloud, and he talks about how you can build a POC or an MVP solution in cloud, but when it comes to owning the solution and providing it to your su subscriber unit, you have to do it on-prem. And mind it, this is coming from the world when on-prem was considered to be almost dead. We were in 2020 and 2019, uh, 2019 when the on-prem is dead, data center was dead, was quite prevalent notion. In fact, one of the biggest employer in Columbus, I think they got rid of their data center five to seven years back in the hopes that they'll move to cloud. And it took them four to five years to move to cloud at that point, and the cost savings were not realized. So th there were studies, and there are th we have data right now that we did not have five years back that tells us that the there's no magic bullet, right? It's not a magic bullet that will serve your IT problems. In fact, if doing it right, and I will come to that analysis later, that what we have to change with our cloud journey, but doing it right is so much more important now than ever before, because we are, everybody's talking about cost savings, ROIs, Amazon laying off staff. I heard that they did, uh, they got rid of AWS now, some of the staff. So cost savings is like 2023 top goal for every organization. So with that, I think the survey conducted with some of the analysis on barriers, 60% said that they have security and risk barriers. And I'm, I'm from a banking background. I've been, bank for, I've been with banks for the last 12 years, and security barrier is real, right? So th in fact, with the cognitive bias that we have against cloud, that my data is exposed to everybody, anybody can see it, that becomes so much more relevant in the conversation that selling a solution with the security or the risk barrier is just a biggest possible challenge that you can see, especially in finance industry. And that was the observation from the survey as well. They had the complexity barrier. You want to know how to do microservices. You have to know, train your staff on how to do containers. So there is a complexity barrier, and that was also highlighted in the presentation uh, that Accenture did. And obviously, you cannot take mainframes away in cloud, right? We all know that problem. So there's a legacy and the infra sprawl that cannot get, we cannot rid of in cloud. Beat, beat high securitization of your on-prem application, or something like mainframes, which cannot go to cloud. Uh, and that was observed through the, uh, through the survey as well. Now we have established that it's not a magic bullet, right? That was evident from the survey. At this point, I had also come to realization when, when I was conce conceiving the talk that it's not a magic bullet, right? 
we are we have to do things right just like any other technology platform and there is as many things that you can do wrong that you'll not see this uh, the right results and with that there was a moment of gut check for me and probably it could be for you that 0% of the real world problems demand a cloud native solution and i put asterisks there because i would get questions from cloud first enterprises that no we need cloud but if we do a gut check it's just an infrastructure in some cases unless you are really going for a saas solution going to cloud and not going to cloud is an option that is given to you as opposed to something that you have to do to make your organization successful right so that's why the asterisks and we can have conversation later on it if you have any questions or want me to take this out of the slide but that's the gut check that i want you to all have at this point that there are problems that we want to solve but nobody from business would come and tell you that can you move me to cloud that will solve my business problem that's the decision that as it team you take that do you really want to go to cloud or not in fact only some people should take that decision because how the underlying infrastructure work should not be a concern to a business right so going back to the theory that we when we were in 2020 and uh, uh, 2019 we were almost the headlines were the data center is almost de dead right the info center for cloud which is a pro very big website and publishes frequent papers they had this headline data center is dead right i was reading an article this morning where they clearly said that edge computing cannot live in cloud and we will talk about edge computing and the the, the specific case that they serve that cannot be solved on something which is centralized data center like a cloud and it need more distributed near to the data uh, computing near to the data capacity so data center is dead then we had a slight shift in the notion when they said enterprise data center won't really go away so there was a time period when they said we need to be both data data center and cloud well the reality today is it's a hybrid world that's a latest headline that you'll see that we have data center we have cloud there are some applications that we know we will never take to cloud and there are some application which could be like a saas offering which resides in clouds and that's okay they are also talking about a super cloud which would be like an abstraction of your multi cloud where is just provide the the feature that you want from the cloud and minuses all the complexity that you see from the cloud environment so the shift in the paradigm is already happening across the enterprise and this is kind of the info world on cloud if you get a chance you should read that material on there they they present the headlines in the way that now it's a hybrid world and that's what is coming next for all the enterprises okay so now i want to talk about if this is some of the things that you observe in your organization then you have a cloud problem hi why i would say that is once we go through the slide you'll realize that maybe you see these patterns or behaviors in your organization first is accidental multi cloud right we i think we all have seen this at this point in our enterprises where you are in aws you are in amazon uh, uh, gcp you are in azure right you are of salesforce cloud you have all the clouds and all of these decisions were taken at different point of time and then you realize now you have all the clouds you have to solve all the vendor problems and you know that part that even though it's all containers it should be all containers but the vendor lock in with cloud is real right so you cannot take an application which is built in like something like aks uh, azure kubernetes services to amazon kubernetes services there are some things some some synchronicities you have to solve for when you change vendor for the cloud right so accident metal multi cloud is one of the common pattern that is seen in most of the organization 
I'm not talking about the SaaS offerings that you see. It's mostly about the IaaS or the PaaS solutions that you have in enterprises, where you'll see the accidental multi-cloud. Or something like design for individual application. A good example which I ran lately into was ETL processing. Okay. So ETL is basically you take a data and you transform it, and uh, you present it to your producers in different format. That's the one that's like for, to describe ETL in 50 words, right? That's how I'll describe it. So ETL was done in my enterprises, uh, my enterprise with SSIS. They used uh, Informatica, and now they want to do Azure Data Factory. So when Azure Data Factory came in, they said, let's move ETL to ADF, which is Azure Data Factory. So now we have SSIS, we have Informatica, Informatica Cloud, and Azure Data Factory. That means you designed your ETL approach based on specific application. Some application were probably suited for SSIS on-prem, some were for Informatica, and some for ADF. Now you need expertise in these three technology set, and now you are also engineered for individual applications. So that is common problem that is seen, that even though you wanted to take your application to cloud to get rid of the legacy complexity problems, but now you have legacy, you have a, a technology set on-prem, and you have a pilot technology set on cloud, and now you have to maintain both of them. And the, the third and the last is, if you are seeing difficulty in making changes to your organization when moving to cloud, or when taking a workload from on-prem to cloud, that's when you realize that you have a cloud migration problem. Meaning, you are not flexible. This will work only if I do microservices in Azure or in, uh, or in AWS. That means you're tied to, the, tied to the vendor and you cannot make changes. So that's a common pattern that is seen with the cloud organizations which did not adopt the cl cloud the right way, and they have a migration problem to cloud. All right, so now we have established that it's not a magic bullet, right? The world is more hybrid as opposed to what was promised that data center is gonna be dead, right? We, we are in cloud and it's ever so expanding, right? So, the, the annual growth for growth is still 18%. It was predicted to be 25% before these financial crises, honestly. But now we are doing some setting based on what we are seeing in the banking industry and finances. And we are saying it's a 18% annual growth in the cloud infrastructure across organization. And finance industry has got a heavy role when it comes to cloud spending. So 18% annual growth, which is huge by any margins, by any other infrastructure, but still it's less, we have adjusted it based on our needs, but it's still going less, and it probably will continue to go less as we see more challenges with our, cl uh, with our cloud and financial returns that we see on the cloud. The other thing is, like we established, Hybrid cloud is the most viable answer. So cloud is not going away. It's going to be ever expanding. And hybrid cloud, meaning you will have your data center, you will probably be residing in cloud, and that's where you'll find the right solution for your organization. The, th the third thing is not everything is going to cloud. IBM just declared that it will take, tw till 2050, they are sold on mainframes, and they will have to expand on their mainframe capability. And when I was doing college, they were said mainframes is dead. We are still hiring mainframe programmers. The mainframe capability is not going away. So if they're college kids, people who are still learning a language, I don't think mainframe is gonna go away anywhere. So if you wanna take up mainframe, it's a good, good tool in your kitty if you wanna take up. So not everything is moving to cloud. Right? You have your security problem. I was just attending a talk last yesterday, and this guy told us 
that even tires with the world of AI, the tire that you use in your car, that will be for service. Tires as a service, he introduced the concept, and I find it very interesting, because he said the amount of wear and tear that you do to your car, ba ba uh, tire based on the number of miles that you do for your cars, you'll pay only that much to your service provider, who will be providing your tire as a service. So we are talking about edge computing and data residing close to the compute, right? So it's going to be a hybrid world where you'll have a super cloud, you'll probably have edge computing and cloud computing all done at the same time to see success for your customer or your stakeholders. And then the final realization is cloud lock-in is real, right? You, are, you cannot take an app, like I said, you cannot take an application from AWS and move it to Azure and just take it like that, even though it's all containers, and assume it will work fine. So we know all these things about cloud today. I'm not against cloud, so if you got this notion that this person is kind of selling that you should not move to cloud, that's the wrong idea. It's ever expanding, we have established that. What I wanna say is, emphasize is, in our journey so far, we know things about cloud today that we did not know five years back. We know that the ROI that was originally promised or at least the way it was promised, it's not evident in our financial bills. Right? So we will see that the, even though the cloud is growing, the financial savings are not met, the business complexity of our problems are not reduced, that means there are probably a few things that we are doing wrong. And one of the things that I realize we could be doing wrong is hiring a team for cloud. And I have had presented this to um, recruit recruitment team in my organization and outside. This is a chat GPT version of a cloud architect position. So I went to chat GPT and said, what does a cloud architect do? Can you give me a job description for a cloud architect? Okay. So pretty interesting. I tr if you have ch used chat GPT, you'll say regenerate, G regenerate. So I did three, four regeneration. Almost looked like the same text and chat GPT said, now you're on your own, I'm done regenerating responses for you. So this was the common theme that, uh, that came from the cloud listing. So few highlights from the listing. The underlying tone for the listing was one to one. On-prem, it worked. Can you take this workload to cloud with the same complexity and make it work and get different results out of it? So if you look at the message or the, uh, the posting for the cloud architect or even for a cloud architecture team or a cloud migration team, it's like, can you take this workload and make it to cloud and then everything should be solved, right? So that was the underlying tone. Which, which, which was pretty interesting for me, be, because I have been through those cloud migration journey myself, and sat with the people that who were responsible for making it successful, and not seeing results. So it was an interesting observation for me. Costs also were associated only with infra. So when, if you're looking at cloud, just an infrastructure option, you're doing it wrong. Let me tell you right away. If you're looking with spending on cloud as just a capex cost, then probably you have missed the critical thing of how to design it right so that you see the savings. So I'll tell you an example. So when I presented the Accenture study and when we talked about uh, size of the organization, they said organizations which are five billion and under they see more cost savings with cloud because they are fully on cloud. Does that mean that I have to do extreme cloud to be successful on cloud? Or it meant the opposite, that only if I have a specific solution that will work on cloud, will I see the results on the cloud? So if you're looking for infrastructure saving, then you are probably missed the design board 
of how to architecture a solution, so costs are essentially associated with the cloud infrastructure, is I think something that was highlighted in the job openings. This was another observation that I have observed in personal life, and something that was evident in this listing, that we are looking for only domain expertise, only from a software architect, only from the tech team, but when it comes to cloud architecture, we are saying, are you vendor SME? Are you Azure SME? Are you AWS SME or GCP SME? And we are discarding all the domain knowledge that an architect or a cloud team needs to have to make a successful journey to cloud. I think that is often overlooked, and hence the solution are so isolated in nature on cloud that you do not see them integrating well with your on-prem applications. And that's a common theme that you'll see in the job postings for the cloud. Again, cloud is just considered as an infrastructure alternative as opposed to trying something which can reduce your organizational co code complexities and can remove your infa uh, legacy infrastructure brawl, right? So these were the common themes. And after talking to these recruiters, we come to a realization that because these job postings had a common theme which limited your cloud knowledge and expertise to just knowing the infrastructure, to just mapping the cost onto cloud, hence the hiring as a result of it was also limited. So the wrong expectations leads to wrong hiring in this case. Now let's talk about cloud teams. We have essentially seen cloud teams meaning you have a project manager. Again, this was produced by ChatGPT and same version of this slide, but the f six common roles is what we see commonly in the cloud teams. One is project manager. You'll see a cloud architect. You definitely see a data migration architect, which is more like an enterprise role. And then you see a security specialist or a DevOps engineer. Think of this. Where in this team do we have a domain expertise highlighted? Not with the role or with the team structure, we are highlighting the need for the domain expertise that the cloud team needs to have so that they can successfully build your solution on cloud. I think the cloud architect as a role, you can call it whatever, but as a role, it should be more like a migration specialist. And that's why this, the title could be, am I looking for a cloud migration specialist? or a cloud architect, or maybe a software architect. Something that I want to share is personal is that when I was uh, kind of conceiving this talk, I was also offered the job of cloud data architect for an organization, a bank of a similar size, and they were also looking for a cloud data architect. Although I was familiar with cloud at that point, and data familiarity was a-okay on my sense, but then when I explored more about the role, and I wanted them to highlight that what is that they're looking for from the cloud data architect, I, I came to a conclusion they were looking for somebody who can solve their data analytics needs. Right? So I declined the position. But for me, it highlighted that you're looking for a person with the title cloud data architect but you could be actually wanting to solve your data analysis problem, right? So from the roles, you are expecting the person to solve your cloud data problem, and that's why you'll hire a cloud data architect, but at the bottom of it, you could have like a data analysis problem, or you could have a software architecture problem, or you could have a data integrity problem. You just do not know. It's like an umbrella of terms that we have created to solve all the cloud problems and expecting it to come out with the right results, right? So, so what do we need to do differently with these openings, with creating the cloud teams? I think the cloud migration process 
needs to be dealt differently. And that's why I want to highlight on this slide that your cloud migration process, which has today the public, public cloud dominance, it should go away. Your cloud migration process should be talking about how you want to take your organization problem and solve them in a certain way as opposed to heavily depending on a public cloud. The other thing that needs to go away is the centralized decision making. We all have been part of organizations which have enterprise architecture as an ivory tower. And the same body of people have been giving cloud decisions as a centralized authority, and that needs to go away in your cloud migration process. A centralized decision making would be something like, I have an engineer on the team, but he does not sit with the team, and he he's a central decision authority taking decision for my team. And that's what cloud architecture, having a centralized dominance, has done for the organization. So as opposed to a central authority, I think cloud roles should sit more closely with the team as opposed to sitting in an ivory tower like an enterprise architecture or a cloud architect team which sits outside of your project team. The third thing is complex workflow that we see in our cloud organizations and that needs to go away. That means you to solve a business problems you don't have to use all the cloud solutions available to you. You have to focus on what actually works for your organization. And then the final and the most important, especially in the context of today's world, that you need to understand the cost fully. So they'll, sell, they'll tell you, we'll give you nine nines of availability on the DR zone, on the primary location, but what is not highlighted is that to maintain this availability, you have to pay this much money. Or you have to, you have to uh, make sure the workloads are not coming on prime time. So there are finance op, uh, fi fin ops or the OPEX costs that you need to understand that are not fully understand in today's cloud migration process. And that has to be done differently. Finally, I would want to emphasize that to achieve sustainable results, uh, you should be building cloud teams. This, this is a thought which uh, another guy, David Knoll, he's now, uh, he's now, lately he accepted the position of CTO of UK government. He said that don't take your workload to clouds, take your teams to cloud. So going back to the philosophy that Imagine a DevOps person sitting separately, not knowing what to do with your build or your uh, execution or implementation, taking that decision as a central authority, and you have to abide by that. I think we had that, uh, we had that migration journey for DevOps as well, when the DevOps engineers sit more closely with the uh, technology teams. Right? Same thing needs to be done for cloud. That means you take your teams to cloud as opposed to your workload to cloud. I think that will change a lot of what we're seeing uh, in today's cloud environment. Again, FinOps needs to be understood better because, so FinOps today, I think it's again centralized. It is something that finance and cloud architecture teams understand as opposed to the entire team knowing what is going in my financials for a cloud and how much do I pay for the service that I'm uh, given on cloud. So FinOps needs to be understood better. And the last is public cloud repatriation. Right? If you are expecting your lift and shift strategy to work on cloud, that's starting it on the wrong foot already. The lift and shift on the cloud takes all your organizational complexity onto the cloud, take all your barriers onto the cloud, and hence, you'll see only limited results, and probably by the end of the exercise, you'll see more cost as a result of the work that you have done as opposed to the output that you're seeing.
And finally, I want to highlight that cloud architecture, just like any architecture branch, is about sustainability. And to produce more efficient results, you should be looking at efficient utilization of resources and making the right design decisions in time so that you can hire a role that you're looking for as opposed to an overloaded term like cloud architect and expecting it to work like a magic bullet for your organization. Yep. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your time and att attention. And please feel free to reach out to me in any questions. And this is my LinkedIn profile. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you.